Welcome to the last webinar of this cycle entitled Chemistry, a Handout to Edge to Society, which included uh, different topics related to chemistry, but also to chemical engineering and biochemistry. Today we are attending the 11th uh, talk of this semester, the last one, and we will have the pleasure of having with us uh, Noemi Encinas Garcia from the Department of Chemical and Materials Engineering. We will talk about the development of uh, liquid repellent surfaces and coatings through physical and chemical modification. And the title of this talk is Control of Wearing Properties to Design Low Fooling uh, Surfaces. In this cycle of, uh, of conferences, we choose the online format because we were in the pandemic context and this type of webinars were also the only alternative. However, we will try in future editions to, to this activity, for, of this activity, uh, which uh, we will certainly do, uh, to move to the face-to-face -face format, which uh, we think that is more appropriate for these seminars. Although we will always try to, to record the, season, the seasons because in this way, you can uh, store these seasons in the, our online channels and some more people can watch the videos. In any case, I would like to thank the, Funda the Fundación General of the uh, Universidad Complutense for helping us to organize these seminars and also uh, to our financial supporters, the Spanish Society of Biochemistry and Molecular uh, Biology, the Royal Society of Chemistry, Sectorial of Madrid, and the Vice Rectorate uh, for Research and Transfer, whom I would like to thank once again for their help and support in organizing this activity. The choice of language for this activity also responds to the fact that we write, discuss, and disseminate the, our science in English. Our junior researchers join our institution after spending a more or, or less prolonged period abroad. Organizing these webinars in English uh, can even make it easier for them to communicate their uh, scientific goals. In this way, we can broaden our audience to foreign institutions, which in many cases, are the ones that have hosted uh, these researches. Then, without further ado, I give the, the, the time of the, to the moderator of this talk, Germán Alcalá, professor of the same department. Professor Alcalá will introduce the speaker and moderate the questions that everybody can write uh, in the preguntas and respuestas key at the bottom of your screen. Then, uh, Professor Alcalá, is your turn. Uh, thank you, Maite. Uh, good morning, everybody. Well, it is a pleasure for me to introduce today to our speaker, uh, Dr. Nami Encinas. Uh, she joined us uh, at the Competency University in a very difficult moment for everybody at the beginning of the pandemic, but she's doing an amazing work with us, from, from both from the teaching and from the research point of view. And it's really, I'm really happy to be here to introduce her to, to all of you. Uh, just to give you a, a short taste about uh, her background and her professional paths, uh, Dr. Nemencina graduated in chemistry in the year 2008 at the Complutense University. She started her research um, at the Molecular Materials Lab, uh, led by Professor Natalio Martin through the INDEA uh, Nanoscience Research Summer Grant in the academic course 2007-2008. Afterwards, she joined, she also obtained her master course with the award of the best uh, master course in the year 2009. She, she completed her PhD in the year 2012 at the Uni University Carlos III uh, in Madrid. Uh, her research efforts were focused on the addition improvement of polymers through surface modification. Then uh, in the year 2014, she joined the Max Planck Institute of Polymer Research in Germany, where she obtained a highly competitive Marie Curie postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, there, she, she worked on the development of new superliquid uh, repellent pattern surfaces to minimize nosocomial bacterial infections. Afterwards, uh, after three years and a half, uh, she came back to the Competence University with the Juan de la Cierva Incorporation Fellowship, uh, and she joined the Smart Biomaterials Group, led by Professor Maria Vallet Regi at the Faculty of Pharmacy here in Madrid at the Competence University. Uh, she was working there for two years. <coughs> um, and she continued during that time the research of anti falling materials with a synergy of drugs, uh, nanocarriers uh, for bone, bone infections. Uh, finally, as I said at the beginning, uh, in the year 2020, 
She joined the Department of uh, Chemical Materials Engineers, Engineering here in the Faculty of Chemistry, uh, as a position of assistant professor, which will be called in Spanish Professor Ayudante Doctor. Uh, and as I said, she's doing an amazing work with us at the Research Group of Surface Engineering and Nanostructural Materials. Today, she's going to talk about the control of wearing properties to design uh, low filing surfaces. And uh, I'm sure we are all going to enjoy very much this uh, her presentation. Uh, as I said also, as, as um, Maite said at the beginning, everybody is welcome to, to ask questions through the chat. So please do so uh, if you find anything you, you need to, to ask. And now I, I, I give the word to, to Emily to, to do her presentation. Thank you very much, Herman. So I would like to start this presentation, I'm sorry, uh, thanking, of course, Maide for the organization of these talks and uh, for giving me the, the, the chance to share some of not so new research, but the last research I, I have been working on. Of course, I also need to thank the Fundación Complutense and all the, the audience. So from the title, you can see that I am mainly going to talk about how to control the wetting properties of uh, surfaces in order to design low folding uh, materials, let's say. Therefore, I am going to focus on some kind of problems that you can face whenever uh, talking about surfaces, especially in contact with liquids. But as I say, I am going to use this talk uh, to summarize somehow my main background and as Herman stated, I came to the university uh, at a kind of a tough time. And uh, therefore, I would like to uh, give the opportunity to the, to the researchers and all the people to know what I am able to offer to you. And uh, maybe we can start any type of collaboration. So, The main aim of my work has been facing the problem of surface contamination. So we can describe this type of issue as the uh, addition of uh, some, time, uh, some type of uh, particles, thin layers, uh, even ice on surfaces that is going to affect the physical chemical properties of materials. Surface contamination can occur during manufacturing, also due to the environment to which surfaces or materials are subjected to, and uh, it leads to major problems related not only to the increase on uh, costs due to maintenance. You can see here an example of a, a solar cell that uh, due to the deposition of dust particles, of course, it's, it's going to reduce its efficiency, so it needs to be cleaned from time to time. It can also increase the fuel consumption on uh, boats, for example. So especially nowadays, we are facing the, the problem of, um, of uh, uh, great economic uh, problems with uh, this issue. And sometimes it can also lead to failure of uh, some type of uh, materials. But, the main uh, uh, problem, the one that is more attractive to me to be solved, to contribute to be solved, is the problem of biocontamination of surfaces. So biocontamination of surfaces described as the deposition of uh, bacterial layers uh, is related to some types of infections. So first of all, we can describe device-related problems for example, those that we can see on contact lenses, uh, catheters, valves, stents, implants, etc., that of course can lead to catastrophic failure and uh, the need to change this type of uh, devices. And also uh, greatly of, of great importance, tissue related problems. So uh, the generation, the association with infections that can lead to uh, a great increase in mortality of patients in hospitals. So it's true that uh, since uh, the uh, 20th century started, uh, due to the public health uh, considered as a community, 
there was a success on the uh, decrease on infectious diseases. And this was uh, achieved due to better hygiene and sanitation um, approaches, also to the uh, development of vaccination and antibiotics. However, something that uh, we are facing nowadays and we can read on even on the newspapers is a new threat that uh, is a, a, is now envisioned due to the antibiotic resistance that this type of bacteria can undergo. So in this uh, slide, we can see how uh, several stages on the development and resistance of uh, um, bacteria against antibiotic has uh, taken place. So taking into account that here you can see the great amount of deaths that are envisioned to, uh, to be uh, attributable to antimicrobial resistance by the year of 2050. It's true that we need to uh, think about a change, think about a new type of solution that implies uh, less use of this type of uh, drugs. So therefore we need to know how a biofilm is formed, how these layers of bacteria are uh, formed on a surface which is uh, in contact with liquid. So firstly, whenever we have a, a surface that uh, is in contact with a, a liquid, so thinking about a, a, the human body, we have uh, firstly the formation of a protein layer that is going to somehow favor the addition of these bacteria. So these, which are firstly on the so-called planktonic state, which is a swimming-like state, are going to uh, basically research the surface until they find a place which is suitable for them to settle down. Once they do so, an irreversible attachment takes place and they start to uh, secrete an external polymeric matrix that is going basically to uh, enclose and uh, somehow uh, protect the colony. So whenever we are on the uh, colony formation and irreversible attachment state, it is going to be more difficult to battle biofilms. So uh, as I said, this type of um, process of biofilm formation is going to encounter to be formed by different stages that will start with the formation of a hydration layer for a, afterwards the adhesion of proteins that are going to uh, favor the biofilm formation and once we have these bacteria and also other type of cells are going to uh, um, to settle down on the surface so we see that we have different uh, time scales in order to diminish or even to block the formation of a biofilm. Traditionally, uh, surface-based strategies are, find, are found, pardon me, both on designing surfaces that can repel this adhesion of bacteria or kill the uh, biofilm whenever they are already formed. As I have stated beforehand, this second uh, type of uh, approaches, the killing ones, are a little bit more complicated and uh, due to the toxicity effects and antimicrobial resistance, in my case, I try to avoid somehow this type of approach. Based on the repel strategies, what we can do is to modify the surface charge, the wetting behavior, the uh, adhesion points that are accessible to microorganisms, so thus the, the topography of the surfaces and also the stiffness, which is going to affect somehow the ability of uh, live material to adhere on a surface. So uh, here is uh, the, the summary of the strategies that I, I am going to show you that I have been working on. Firstly, since I was uh, working as a Marie Curie Fellow uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research in Germany, and 
at the Smart Biomaterials uh, Group at the Faculty of Pharmacy here at the Universidad Complutense. So the first three approaches uh, that you can see that are this super hydrophobic, super amphiphobic and liquid-like surfaces are all of them based on controlling the wetting behavior of surfaces. The last one will combine this uh, somehow this type of, uh, of route with the use of uh, nanocarriers for drug delivery. So I will start with the super hydrophobic uh, approach. And for that, I need to do a, a very brief state of the art. So, uh, you know, that it, it's always extremely useful to uh, look at nature and try to mimic uh, its behavior. So in this case, uh, researchers uh, have been intensively working on trying to um, mimic somehow the behavior of the lotus leaf. So this, you can see here in this video, this presents a certain type, a certain type of uh, wetting behavior that basically allows water droplets to uh, greatly move alongside the uh, leaf. This has been proved to be due to the existence of a hierarchical distribution of uh, roughness. So we have a roughness on different length scales. And finally, we have also a coating formed by wax. So apart from this uh, uh, roughness, we have a hydrophobic uh, coating. Therefore, whenever rain encounters the lotus leaf, uh, Basically, uh, this high mob uh, mobility promotes the um, capability of the leaf to self-clean itself. Water is going to catch all the dust particles and as it will roll easily on the surface whenever it, uh, it's tilting, uh, it will become clean. Similarly, we can see the behavior of the pitcher's plant. So we also have a certain distribution of channels with a, a, a roughness that allows, in this case, ants to nicely walk through the plant whenever it's dry. However, when rain comes and the plant becomes wet, wetted, uh, these type of channels are going to act as a lubricant. So all the ants are going to go inside the plant and it, it can basically eat them. So we have seen that it's uh, of great importance to design this type of uh, surfaces to have entrapment of air, or I would rather say of a fluid. This is going to be essential to promote uh, mobility of the liquid, which is uh, allocated on top of the surface, and therefore it will promote a self-cleaning ability. So we need to briefly know that uh, the wetting behavior of the surface is going to be um, defined by several wetting models. The first of all, the very general one is the Young's equation, which is going to define this deposition of a liquid on a solid surface. So we just need to remember that here we are going to have three type of interfacial tensions. And we have uh, the formation of a, a contact angle between the liquid and the surface. The higher the contact angle, the uh, more hydrophobic the surface is and therefore the higher mobility of the liquid. So if we can somehow create a quite rough surface, liquid is going to be uh, resting on top of protrusions. And this is going to be defined by the so-called Cassie-Baxter state. However, this type of state cannot uh, last forever due to gravity and capillary forces. So uh, normally, depending on uh, the height of the asperities and the um, surface tension of the liquid and also the uh, distribution between them, this liquid, it will, find, it will finally wet completely the surface. So we will encounter the so-called Wenzel state. So uh, going to this very first superhydrophobic approach, 
uh, we need to know that traditionally the uh, conditions to define a super hydrophobic surface have been having an advancing contact angle of a 150 degree or above, defining this advancing contact angle as the one that we have on the front side of the droplet, of the liquid droplet, when the surface is tilting. A hysteresis below 10 degree, let's say when this droplet is moving along a tilting surface, the difference between the advancing and the receding part, and also a sliding angle below 10 degree. So every researcher trying to design a, a good super hydrophobic surface has been normally trying to uh, basically um, accomplish these requisites. But here, when I was working at the Max Planck Institute uh, Research in Germany, we found the very first uh, problem, or we uh, basically asked ourselves uh, whether we were measuring this correctly. Normally, contact angles are measured with an optical goniometer, which presents uh, certain limitations. So we saw that uh, even using different types of adjustments, uh, we were not nicely measuring or exactly measuring the contact angle between the liquid and the surface whenever we were patterning this type of super hydrophobic surfaces. So this is also a measurement that is normally done under static conditions. And of course, when we go to nature, what we find is a dynamic type of wetting. So under these conditions, we thought, OK, so how the liquid is able to overcome this air gap and how is possible how we can measure contact angles above 150 degree, thinking about the limitations that we have with an optical goniometer. So the research developed here uh, uh, was published on a very beautiful uh, work, I, I have to say, which is a physical review letter published in 2016. And uh, in order to study this type of dynamic wetting, what we did is uh, was firstly to uh, design a patterned surfaces using photolithography. So we uh, created surfaces with uh, micro pillars of different heights and different separations. We labeled these pillars and also we labeled the liquid deposited on top of them in order to visualize, uh, visualize everything with a laser confo uh, confocal scanning microscope. But of course, uh, you can say, okay, this type of uh, visualization is nice, but how can you measure the dynamic wetting just by using a laser scanning microscope? So what we did was to mount all the microscope uh, with a hydraulic um, uh, device and we tilted the whole system. So we could measure everything uh, uh, directly. So, our findings were quite nice. We saw that on the advancing part of the droplet, whenever this was uh, tilting, the droplet was encountering the surfaces of the pillars quite smoothly until it basically completely rolled. So you can see here on the uh, lower side of the, of the um, slide, how the contact angles on the advancing side measured both with the microscope, with the laser scanning microscope and the goniometers were around 160 degrees. So uh, it was a nice measurement with the traditional method, but the, more, uh, the most important uh, finding here was that on the back part, on the receding part, we saw that capillary bridges were formed so the motion of the droplet here was not so smooth. We had certain jumps and in this case, the angle was around 140 degree. So basically uh, our findings uh, were capable to uh, define a new requisite for superhydrophobicity, which was not having a, an advancing contact angle above 
150 degree, but a receding one. This was the one that was going to uh, really uh, make a, a difference between surfaces. Now going for uh, going to the super amphiphobic surfaces here, uh, one can think, uh, okay, so which is the main difference? So the main difference is that uh, by having a certain roughness and also a certain height of obesity on the surface, we can define a super hydrophobic surface for water, which is a liquid with a high surface tension. But what is going to happen to take place if we have a low surface tension liquid is that it's going to be prone to uh, to wet the surface because it's not uh, able to overcome these capillary forces and gravity forces. So whenever we are thinking about oils or even blood, we need to add an extra layer of roughness, a surface which is capable to um, avoid being wetted both by water and organic liquids is a so-called super amphiphobic uh, surface. So uh, in, in the group where I was working on uh, in Germany, uh, they developed an extremely nice example of this type of surfaces in 2012. Uh, this uh, was published on, on science and it was a coating formed with uh, um, particles, carbon particles, that were basically collect, collected from a, a candle. So uh, this candle suit template, which uh, was a fractal-like structure that of course presented a really high fragility, was coated by chemical vapor deposition with a silica layer in order to increase this uh, mechanical robustness, let's say. And afterwards it was uh, removed, the carbon inside by calcination and chemically modified with a perfluorosilane. Of course, as it's formed by silica, it allows basically any type of chemical modification due to the existence of silanol groups. So what they found was a, a porous-like structure that uh, could be rendered transparent uh, uh, by calcination. And in terms of wetting, it presented, uh, presented an extremely nice repellency against basically any type of oil. So uh, the very first uh, proof of concept uh, was uh, to try to use this type of coatings to develop uh, membranes for blood oxygenation. So uh, a comparison with a normal Teflon membrane was done and an experiment uh, um, under either flow conditions and static conditions was, uh, was done. Under flow conditions, macroscopically, of course, the uh, super amphiphobic uh, coating uh, seemed to be completely clean, which was not uh, uh, taking place with the Teflon one. And going to uh, scanning electron microscopy images, we also saw that in principle, there was no cell absorption. But of course, uh, as we saw at the very beginning of this talk, uh, no cell adsorption is not meaning that we don't have biofolding. So we need to go uh, for, um, let's say, a lower size. So as uh, we were running these experiments with blood, uh, we also created meshes that were uh, in contact with it, with blood for six hours or even 24 hours. And we evaluated the protein uh, adsorption. So uh, we saw that under static conditions, there was a certain uh, adsorption of uh, proteins. And under flow conditions, this was below six micrograms per square centimeter, which in principle seems to be a, a very good number, but considering that a uh, fibrinogen um, addition provoking platelet activation is in the range of nanogram per square centimeter, we really needed to define whether our surfaces were surfaces uh, exhibiting no falling ability or just a low falling one. So uh, here we uh, we basically went to uh, to better tools, let's say really sensitive tools. 
So uh, we used X-ray for the electron spectroscopy and the signal of nitrogen as a probe to detect proteins. We used the signal because the rest of signals that uh, could be, um, let's say, um, uh, signals that could lead us to think that we had proteins uh, were also common to the surface. So, for example, silicon, oxygen, etc. So, uh, in the very first um, in the very first experiment, we saw that for the super amphiphobic coating, which is this upper one with the uh, straight line, there seemed not to be any type of nitrogen adsorption, but we decided to incubate the surface for longer times under human serum uh, and also bovine serum um, um, solutions. And we run high resolution uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy um, experiments. And we saw that there was no case in which a nitrogen signal arose. We needed to prove also with other techniques whether this was, uh, this was true. So we um, um, used TOF SIMS. Uh, this was done in the University of, uh, of Washington. And basically what we saw, uh, attending to the fragments that were detected on both a, a controlled flat silica surface and our superamphiphobic coatings, we saw that in the case of the flat silica, uh, it was possible to detect protein fragments, but on the superamphiphobic surface, the only ones that we could uh, saw were uh, just uh, fragments that were corresponding to the structure of the, of the coating. So uh, we could prove somehow a super liquid repellency and also a super protein repellency ability. We uh, somehow established a mechanism that was based on the extremely high mobility of, uh, of uh, the, the liquid containing the proteins on top of our candle soot based super amphiphobic coating. Furthermore, in 2020, uh, we published another work uh, that uh, basically studied the uh, effect of sub-micrometer sized roughness on suppressing uh, bacterial addition. So in this case, uh, the roughness that we used to create this type of super amphiphobic coatings was, was slightly uh, higher than the one for the candle suit based. So we worked with a, a control flat surface, um, an, an array of um, photolithography formed pillars and the so-called silicon nanofilaments. These nanofilaments were formed with a trichloromethyl silane and they present a spaghetti-like uh, topography and can be modified with different chemistries. So what we evaluated were these uh, silicon nanofilaments with a methyl a group termination, fluorinated, and what was extremely interesting for us was to decide whether the existence of this air layer or air plastron below the uh, coating and, and, and the, uh, below the liquid and the coating really played a, a role on bacterial addition or whether the main uh, role was played by the topography. So uh, we tested our surfaces against uh, a typical bacteria, which is uh, E. coli. And we saw that, uh, first of all, for a normal fluorinated glass, as uh, it was hydrophobic, but it was quite smooth, bacteria really liked it. So uh, we had a good uh, distribution of bacteria on the surfaces. We also found this on top of pillars, but whenever we went for the silicon nanofilaments, regardless uh, they, they were uh, hydrophobic or even hydrophilic, we saw that the distribution of bacteria was quite low. So we studied this and as I said, this was an important finding. We saw that 
either the uh, even the uh, silicon nanofilaments that were uh, super hydrophilic after plasma treatment showed a higher addition of bacteria on the surfaces compared to the hydrophobic ones. Even at this case, it was way lower than the ones that we could find for a normal flat surface or even a, a typical pillar based surface. So we decided that this was done to the fact that the space between the nanofilaments was uh, on the range of uh, 0.2 or 1 micrometers, which is way below the bacterial size, normally between 1 to 5 uh, micrometers. So uh, the number of uh, addition points that are accessible for these bacteria are quite low. And what is uh, more important, we saw that uh, indeed the air plastron played a minor role on bacterial addition. So in order to design a good, um, let's say, antibiofolding surface, it is more important to play with the surface roughness rather than to play with surface chemistry. So we used this to, uh, to code a narrow and long tubes so we could uh, define a promising candidate for uh, catheters that couldn't undergo bacterial addition, therefore uh, mini uh, were able to minimize somehow infections. So this work was published on advanced materials. And here, what, uh, what we did was to uh, activate uh, long tubes of different materials uh, ranging from polymers such as a uh, high density polyethylene, polypropylene, low density polyethylene, or a, a polyurethane, up to um, composites, metals, and even ceramics. And we coded these type of, uh, of uh, tubes with the silicon nanofilaments. After subjecting them to uh, different types of uh, solutions, such as a, a buffer solution, like a PBS, a, a urine solution, blood plasma, or even a low surface tension a solution, such as a, a methyl diodide, we saw that in every case, uh, they were able to repel water. And therefore, we could uh, envision a, a, very, a very nice uh, medical uh, application for this type of uh, super amphiphobic surfaces. And finally, I would like to talk uh, briefly about uh, uh, some uh, research that I had the, the, the great opportunity to run when I came back to, to Spain to the Smart Biomaterials Group. Uh, and, uh, oh, pardon me. I am going to work uh, to talk firstly about the metal oxide photocatalyst. Sorry. So this was also done on, on Germany. So, uh, Finishing with this type of uh, liquid repellent surfaces, it is also possible to combine the uh, liquid repellency with uh, the uh, photocatalytic activity that some type, uh, some uh, metal oxides exhibit. So this type of photo, uh, photocatalytic activity upon the um, irradiation with the ultraviolet light is capable to promote water splitting. Therefore, we can uh, run purification of uh, water. Also, uh, it somehow catalyzes some chemical reactions. And what uh, we tried to do here in the, the work that I run with uh, San Yuk Hu in 2017 was to develop surfaces that upon combining super liquid repellency and photocatalytic activity were capable to change their behavior from hydrophilic up to hydrophobic and therefore uh, exhibit self-cleaning, antibiofolding, and also uh, the possibility to react on non-polar solvents. So uh, the methodology was quite simple. We just uh, had a glass cover, uh, a cover glass coated with um, a titanium dioxide thin film, and we immersed it on a PDMS uh, liquid. Upon the radiation with the UV light, we were capable to covalently graft a, 
PDMS brushes, which uh, were acting as a liquid-like surface. And firstly, we saw that this type of uh, coating could be applied to very, very different types of surfaces, which uh, could be almost universal, let's say. It presented really good uh, self-cleaning uh, um, properties. So on the microscopic scale, uh, if we had a particles, dust particles, uh, in this case, it was a uh, chalk, just by applying water droplets due to the, to the really high mobility of uh, the water droplets, the particles uh, were just removed from the surface. And also, if we had any type of organic contamination just by illumination with UV light, due to the photocatalytic activity of the surface, we could remove it. Furthermore, we also run um, antibiofolding or antimicrobial tests with uh, E. coli, and we saw that under dark conditions, uh, E. coli could uh, somehow um, live on the surfaces, but I have to say that due to the high mobility of the liquid, it was uh, easy to remove them just by flashing a buffer solution. And upon irradiation, due to the combination of the photocatalytic activity, we could kill these bacteria without using any type of biocides. So this is a quite promising route to uh, create this type of uh, low falling surfaces. And as I stated beforehand, now I can show you the uh, the nice work that I that I could uh, that I could work on when I came here to the Universidad Complutense. So uh, basically, uh, in this work, um, what we thought was okay. If we are working with drug nanocarriers, which we have already seen a, a, an extremely nice talk from Miguel Gisbert talking about the, these type of uh, materials, drug nanocarriers, in this case, uh, uh, mesoporous silica particles, which uh, can be loaded with a drug and, uh, uh, let's say, directed to um, the infection point, we have a problem, which is the nanoparticle uptake uh, by phagocytes. So this means that when these type of nanocarriers are trying to uh, act as a vehicle for the drug to reach the infection due to, first of all, the formation of a protein corona and afterwards internalization by recognition by the immune system, they are not going to be able to reach the, the, the focus, the infection. So the, effic the efficiency of the treatment is reduced. So normally, pedulation has been used to diminish this, uh, but it has certain um, drawbacks, such as the great increase in the particle size, therefore the toxicity of the system, and also the reduce on the drug delivery and lack of elicitation uh, of an immune system. So what we tried to do here on this work that I, 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 run, off, I run with uh, Dr. Montserrat Colilla and Isabel Izquierdo was to uh, create, um, let's say, a, a nanocarrier that was able to somehow avoid this type of internalization. So uh, by knowing that a sweeter ion uh, is defined as uh, um, a, group, a, a distribution of groups with an equal number of positive or negative surface charges on pendant groups that basically promotes a certain electrical neutrality. And it creates a hydration layer that somehow reducing the non-specific protein adhesion. We uh, wanted to modify the traditional mesoporous silicon nanoparticles with uh, these type of groups. So we used a direct grafting method with a short uh, chain uh, amino and phosphonate silanes that uh, upon a distribution a ratio of one to 1 1.5 of the amino uh, to a phosphonate yielded a zeta potential of around five millivolts, which is uh, close to zero. 
And we called them pseudo suiterions uh, due to the fact that these groups uh, are hydrodisable. And also we worked just on uh, physiological conditions. But uh, we proved by traditional techniques for these materials, such as uh, X-ray diffraction and um, transmission electron microscopy, that uh, after, uh, after grafting of these uh, brushes, we uh, kept, we maintained the hexagonal mesoporous arrangement of the nanoparticles. And by nitrogen adsorption and desorption porosimetry, what we saw was a, a reduction on the, um, on the available, let's say, pores. So uh, this was attributed to the fact that these short chain uh, grafting moieties were partially blocking the pores, but still we had a certain um, area, certain um, window to load a drug on them. So the first thing that we studied was the internalization of this type of uh, systems on, uh, by using raw murine cells. And we incubated them for 90, method, uh, 90 minutes, pardon me. So as control, we used uh, bare nano, uh, nanoparticles and also bedulated nanoparticles. And what we saw was that uh, the internalization of the particles upon modification with both these uterions and also the uh, uh, pedulated uh, systems was uh, greatly reduced compared to the, to the uh, bare nanoparticles. And also the viability of the cells was, uh, was uh, kept after the uh, modification. Therefore, we uh, established uh, the possibility of these particles to really uh, be directed to the focus of the infection without uh, uh, being um, engulfed by the immune system. For the drug uh, delivery, we uh, basically studied a very uh, simple system, which was to load them uh, with an impregnation method with the level of fluoxacin. And what we saw was firstly that uh, the uh, suiterion uh, nanoparticles uh, presented a higher loading ability, which we assumed to come from the affinity of the amine groups towards the, the, the level, the drug uh, chemistry. And for the release, it was established a first order kinetic uh, um, behavior in which we had a very fast releasing of the drug at the very beginning, followed by a plateau. Finally, to define the antimicrobial activity, we saw that for a different um, um, concentrations of the colloidal suspension, in this case, five and 10 micrograms, uh, per milliliter, we saw that against uh, pathogenic bacteria such as E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus, our systems, which are here presented uh, in blue, uh, showed a, a quite nice uh, reduction on the uh, microbial viability. Therefore, this, uh, this uh, platform is a quite nice platform to be used to battle infection in the so-called personal nanomedicine. So this, uh, with this, I would like to finish and uh, to thank uh, again um, all the audience and the, and the organization uh, and of course, I will be very pleased to answer any type of question that you have now. Thank you very much. Well, yes, uh, thank you very much for your talk. It's been really, really interesting. You talk uh, about many different uh, works in all your research and experience in different laboratories. And uh, I found it uh, really very interesting. Uh, I don't know if there are questions. I'm going to have a look in the, in the chat. Uh, but there's just one question, but it's, it's not for for, no, it's for me. me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you want Maite, you can answer to the question, and then we go to to the questions to the talk of Nami. Just to... well, uh, well, of course that uh, uh, we are trying to organize this kind of seminars next uh, year because I think that it's uh, some kind of. Uh, 
um, activity that uh, PC, I, I think that made visible the, the research in our faculty in our faculty and I think that this is very important uh, because um, I am pretty sure about the quality of our research but I know that many more people have witnesses of the quality of and prestige of our uh, institution especially in terms of research then uh, of course uh, I think that sometimes this, this is a question of visibility. We need visibility and we need to, to, to show the, the research that, that we are doing, uh, not only for our students, also for different collaborations with other departments and also different groups of our research. And I think that is very important to do that. And we, it's, it's our, we are planning also in another system, another format maybe, but we, we continue with this kind of activity. But I, I have also questions uh, in terms of your speech. <laughs> when you talk about the super amphiphobic uh, coatings, um, which kind of uh, utilities you can give to this kind of materials? Because I was thinking about, uh, for instance, uh, some kind of uh, processes, for instance, uh, materials in processes, but also to avoid the, the interaction with the bacteria, maybe can also uh, give some kind of um, problems in terms of, uh, I don't know, maybe if you think about capillars or you think about these kind of things, maybe uh, it's uh, something that you are thinking that this material could be a good uh, option for this kind of, uh, to, to substitute some kind of uh, biological materials. In, the body, mm -hmm. the human body. Yeah, it, it, indeed, uh, the, the main idea I would rather say is not to uh, substitute, but to, let's say, uh, improve. So we, we can modify with a, a very large range of uh, coatings, uh, also uh, almost any type of surface. So this, uh, it is of great importance, even though I, I assume that maybe the last part uh, can be a little bit different. We need to think about that. Uh, uh, going to your question about uh, devices such an, an implant, the combination, for example, between these surfaces that uh, can somehow promote a really high mobility, so are not uh, going to a low bacteria to find a nice place to settle down and grow. Combining this with the use of uh, drugs uh, uh, of nanocarriers is of extreme importance because uh, this type of uh, wetting repellent surfaces, of course, due, as I said, due to capillary forces and also to flow conditions, uh, etc., they can uh, change from the Cassie Baxter, so the, the existence of air up to the wen cell state, so everything is wetted, and occasionally bacteria can settle down. So if this happens and we have a second platform to battle this infection, this can be of extreme importance. Uh, going slightly farther, uh, this work that I showed uh, with, the, with the tubes, with coating the long tubes, it, it perfectly shows how you can um, modify uh, something that <coughs> is, is a medical device that everybody is using, such a catheter, and uh, it can be coated with a, a super amphiphobic coating, which is non-toxic and uh, it will basically reduce up to the very lowest uh, limit the addition of, a, of any type of microorganism. So this means that we can use them for longer time. And of course, that we reduce the um, impact of nosocomial infections. So I, I really think that this is a, a research uh, area that, um, that needs to be uh, let's say, that, that needs to, to find more contributors. Uh, all right, uh, I also have a few questions. One thing that I very much about your talk is that uh, I was taking notes of the things I wanted to ask you, but just one minute later, you were answering already to, the, to my questions. <laughs> <laughs> so there are not many questions to ask because of this. You, you did probably too well. <laughs> uh, I'm curious about, uh, you talk about some um, difficulties with the optical ergonometer to measure, to measure the angles between the liquid and the surface. Uh, uh, what kind of difficulties you, you meant? Well, uh, 
It's true. This is something that uh, I, I really like your question because uh, I can uh, basically say now that, of course, uh, the type of investigation of work that uh, that uh, we showed on these uh, physical review letters that is, is really beautiful, it can be done just by using this type of tools which are not available to for everybody, of course. So the traditional method of uh, measuring contact angles with a, a, a goniometer is, of course, okay, it's acceptable and, and you can define your surfaces quite nicely. But what we saw, we, we really thought that uh, there was something that was missing because we were comparing different types of uh, liquid repellent surfaces. And uh, we really uh, had the, the feeling that uh, we were not ni nicely measuring the, the contact angle. So basically what we did was to zoom and we saw that uh, even changing the algorithm, that is something that the, the programs uh, uh, for this type of measurement have, even changing all the types of algorithms, there was always a certain uh, difference between the angle, what would you really saw on the picture and what the uh, program was measuring. So that's the reason why we decided to try to give a chance for the uh, laser scanning confocal microscope to, uh, to be used. And, and we really saw that there was an underestimation of the advancing part. So with the goniometer, you could just measure up to around 150, and that was measuring uh, really nicely. And with uh, the, the laser scanning confocal, we saw that the angles were really reaching 180. So that was a, a great gap. All right. Uh, I'm also curious about something else. Uh, you mentioned one of the conclusions of, of part of your work was that well, the material used to produce the roughness of the surface to mm -hmm. achieve this uh, super hydrophobicity or super amphiphobic uh, behavior uh, is not related to the material the, the, the coating is made of. It's, it's mainly Due to the actual roughness and the and the features of the of the topographic surface, uh, on the other hand, I guess the the material used to produce the the coating and to produce this roughness might have uh, other implications in the application of of, of the coating. Uh, for instance, if it is uh, used for uh, for to cover a prosthesis or to cover something that's going to be in contact with the uh, with the blood or any other. Uh, fluid of the body, uh, it, I guess, has to be a, a material that doesn't dissolve in, in this kind of liquids. So it has to be a material that doesn't produce toxic particles. Uh, what are your what is your opinion about this? What kind of materials are more suitable for this kind of application? That that's also a really good question. So uh, it's true that, that that's a there is a controversy uh, about this fact uh, whether it's more important to chemically modify the surface or to physically modify it. So uh, we were, let's say, on the second side. So, so that's what we wanted to prove. And uh, with, the, with the conclusion of our work in which we uh, thought that uh, indeed the existence of a certain topography was then the factor and the main point to reduce bacterial addition, uh, if that is really confirmed with the further studies, that means that you can basically design any type of surface with any type of material just by uh, creating with different techniques uh, a certain hierarchy of roughness. And this means that uh, you wouldn't even need to modify chemically because of course, any type of, uh, let's say, flooring containing a, a moiety, it's not uh, the, the, the best thing that you want to have uh, on your, your body, inside your body. So uh, just uh, this fact of the change in, in physical properties means that uh, as, as you were asking, uh, you can go to any type of material, just designing nicely, which is the size and scale of the topography. 
And uh, I'm sorry, I am going to extend just a little bit the, the, <laughs> this answer because it will uh, basically connect with the very first question of uh, Maide. So uh, you have seen that my main interest, because I find it a, an extremely attractive uh, uh, research uh, area, I based everything on the biological aspect. So control of wetting properties uh, for antibiofouling um, applications. But this type of control of wetting is of extreme importance also to uh, reduce corrosion of uh, surfaces of metals. So uh, you can basically broaden the, the, the potential of these coatings. Right, thank you very much, Marie. Uh, in fact, uh, I, don't, I don't have any more questions. I, I really found it uh, so clear, so explaining your, your talk. I don't know if Mighty wants to, to ask me anything else. No? Okay. Uh, well, then I, I would like to thank you again for, for your talk, Marie. I think it was very, really, really interesting. And uh, just to, to say bye to everybody. I want to say also, because uh, first of all, I want to, to thank uh, Noemi because it was a very interesting talk, very interesting talk. And I think that uh, I am sure that a lot of people maybe contact, will contact you <laughs> from now. But I have, this is the last uh, talk, then I want to, uh, uh, I want to thank everybody to attend these webinars. Uh, thank you to the speakers because uh, they, they, I am sure that they have increased the, the level of, the research level of our faculty, and it's something that we have to thank. Uh, thank you, the moderators, because uh, they help a lot to know better um, the curricula of our researchers. And I hope that we will see you next year. Then goodbye, everybody, and thank you. <laughs>